guys, how's it going? So today we decided to film a Q&A, which is a super nice break for me because it's been so hot and we've been doing so many like big projects. I don't know why we waited till the middle of summer to like remove sod and put in landscape for other people. It's been a really fun um, kind of group of projects, but oh my goodness, it feels good to sit here. And I hope you guys are all surviving the summer and surviving the heat and I hope your gardens are doing well. I know it takes a lot of extra work and water and just fortitude to make it through this time of year to where it starts to cool off a little bit and the plants start to refresh and we feel refreshed and I can't wait for that time right now. Uh, before we get into the questions though, I did want to talk about the Grand Garden Show because it's something that we're gonna be at here next month. Um, so Sunday, August 25th through Tuesday, August 27th is the Grand Garden Show on Mackinac Island in Michigan. We've done a couple of videos before in the past when we've had a chance to attend and it's an experience that you will never forget. Um, so if you have a chance, the packages, like the um, event packages are sold out, but their day pass is still available. So if you're in the Mackinac Island, Michigan area or anywhere near or even not, if you wanna make the trip up for you know a day or a couple days or whatever, I mean, it's totally worth it because there are classes and there are garden tours and it's just, it's kind of an out of this world experience and you get so much inspiration. Anyway, so we will be there at the event. If you don't have a chance to go, I did wanna show you this because I just got it. It's called The Gardens of Mackinac Island. It is um, written by Jack Barnwell, who designs and maintains many of the gardens on the island. Um, and it's many of the gardens, actually all of the gardens that are on the tour are designed and maintained by Jack. Um, and this book is like, a beautiful book, beautiful pictures, lots of beautiful plants and explanations and stuff like that. So anyway, we'll link it down below if you're interested. Okay, so let's get into the questions and I'm gonna try to not be long-winded in my answers, which I tend to be, so we can move through as many questions as possible. So this first group of questions comes from our YouTube members. Donna asks, what happened to your asparagus that was in the beds that were removed during building the chicken coop? Um, so the asparagus got removed which is super unfortunate. The raised beds that were there that I planted in, I was just trying to make the most of the space, but they were horribly placed. They were placed right in the middle of our driveway. They didn't get proper amounts of sun. Uh, and we were on year three of the asparagus, so I was gonna be able to start harvesting. But um, like I said, I just didn't have time to remove them. And we've enjoyed the chicken coop so much that I haven't missed them that much. And asparagus roots are really easy to come by in the spring. So I figured I would just plant them somewhere else in the near future. Question from Jennifer, with the success of your planter with the red cannas, have you changed your mind about having red in the landscape? Uh, I don't know if I've actually changed my mind. I do love that container. I think mostly because it makes me proud of myself for stretching myself out of my comfort zone and using that bright of a red and the fact that it's performing so well. I mean, I would like anything, no matter what color it is, if it performs for me. Um, you know, there are some times where I think it would be kind of nice to just do a little section that um, highlights more red and warm, like orange. I use a lot of warm orange, but that kind of combines all of those warm colors together. Um, and that way it's kind of away from all of my soft pinks and soft yellows, so it doesn't clash. That's the only reason, you guys, why I don't really use red in the garden because it just is so jarring with my other color scheme. It's not that I don't really like it, it's just that it doesn't blend. Mally asks, Laura, what's your favorite Thai recipe? And Erin, when will you start on Christmas lights? July is basically December. Agreed. <laughs> I'm, I'm almost ready for December at this point. Erin, when are you gonna start Christmas lights? Just before Halloween. Erin says just before Halloween is when he'll start, which is so good because if we have a bad winter, which we haven't for two years, but if we do, it's so nice that he gets to jump on it, especially with the roof. Like I don't like the thought of anybody being up there if it's unsafe. So if he gets to start on it earlier when it's coo uh, not cooler, warmer out and a little bit uh, more comfortable and safer, I just like that thought. Um, my favorite Thai recipe, I have a few. Um, but they've all been kind of adapted and honed based on our family's taste. But it's one called Bikra Pao beef, which is like a basil beef. And then cashew chicken is really good. And um, Tom Kha Gai, I think is how you say it. It's a coconut milk based soup with um, chicken and shrimp. And it's yummy. There's lemongrass in it and it's super good. Nancy asks, do you have any interest in growing any type of fruit trees on your property in the future? I do, like I have an interest in almost anything related to gardening. Look, I would like to dabble in all of it. Um, I don't know where we would site an orchard here on our property. I still haven't decided um, whether or not I'm gonna add uh, espalier trees or trained trees into those onto those arches that we uh, put up in the back formal garden. I had thought initially that I would do pears or apples on those arches. 
because um, I actually saw it in the movie Emma when they're walking through this tunnel of arbors and they all had apple trees, which I'm sure was heavily staged. And my, excuse me, my apple trees would probably never look that good in real life, but it was kind of an inspiring scene in that movie um, that I remember since I was a little girl. So um, I might still do that there. Um, you know, in terms of like large size fruit trees, I probably won't on this property unless we are able to in the future maybe have more property. Um, because I don't really have a good space to allot for it. I think I could do trained trees though, like espalier trees, you know, flat ones up against walls. I've thought about that for several different areas in our yard. Then this one, Aaron might have to chime in. He's sitting over here. Uh, any tips for someone who's going to be putting in a new sprinkler system next year? Just moved to a new home. I don't want to create some new beds and I'm wondering, or I do want to create some new beds, excuse me. And I'm wondering if I should get those done before getting the sprinkler system done. Yes, so I will say, like you have everything as mapped out as possible so you know where to put your sprinkler lines for grass as opposed to where to have your drip system because if you don't put your flower beds in first and you have your sprinkler lines like way up like against your house or against a fence or whatever and then you cut your flower beds out then you're gonna have to move all your sprinklers into where the grass line is so have it as mapped out as possible any other tips Aaron? So Aaron says to plan for extra drip zones, which is something he's worked on here in our property. Um, when we moved in, all of our, our sprinklers and drip zones were connected together. So when we ran grass, it ran a drip zone somewhere and the pressure wasn't right. So there were areas that weren't getting watered correctly. So last year he went through and we now have 28 drip zones. Yeah. Yeah, some of which are like 15 feet of drip tubing. Like that's the zone. But if you have lots of different zones that you can expand on, it's so much easier in the future because like in Versailles, I have one little uh, strand, strand, one little <laughs> ring of drip tubing around our urn and that's one zone. But I know in the future, we're going to be tearing up Versailles to do something different and I'm gonna wanna expand that zone and utilize it. So anyway, yeah, plan for extra zones and just be as organized and planned out as possible as uh, to where you want your lines to be. Laura asks, uh, what color are you thinking on the gazebo? So we're sitting in the gazebo right now. I don't know if you can see right behind me, but the wood has a finish on it that's kind of orange, which I don't love. I don't love the color of that. It's kind of hard. It makes it look a little bit too rustic for the style of our house. Um, we have considered painting it and I have absolutely no idea what color to paint it. Like my first inclination is to say white because white gazebos are beautiful and our house is white and now our chicken coop and our tool shed are white and our barn will eventually be white. Um, but I don't know if I, if I really want this to be white because the roof is so chunky. And I don't know if having a white bottom would look weighty enough to hold up this massive root, uh, roof. And that's the only thing that's kind of holding me up. I also thought like a soft dove gray would be beautiful or a soft green would be beautiful. Something that just kind of um, not disappeared into the landscape, but was just a softer approach and didn't like, you know, scream out at you. Because when you come in our driveway, you can see across Versailles to the gazebo. And if it was white, I think it almost might take away from what's in Versailles if that makes sense, because all you would see is this big white gazebo hanging out in the background. So I don't know, I'm super undecided, although I do know I want a change. I just am not sure what. Laura also asks, I've discovered apple cedar rust on my crab apple leaves. Can I treat easily or is it doomed to be removed? And this is actually a really great question because I wanted to share a problem solver app with you guys. So this is from Bonide and I have it here on my phone. So I'm just gonna open it up um, to show you guys how to use this because it's so helpful. Uh, whether or not you know what you're dealing with or if you don't, you can kind of hone in on your problem and figure out how to take care of it. So when you open up, you can search either by pest or by plant. So like in this case, we know it's a crab apple. So when you open up the search by plant, you see, you know, you can click on lawns, roses, flowers, shrubs, trees, etc. Um, we're gonna click on trees and then we are gonna scroll down and find the crab apple here. And then on the left side there, you see all the symptoms. So if you don't know what's going on, you can go through and read these symptoms and kind of figure out which one you're dealing with. And then on the right side, you can see what's causing that. Um, so if we scroll down, we see powdery orange spots on leaves, which is the rust on plants is the cause. So we're gonna click on that. And that will take you to a new screen that shows you all the different things that you can do to take care of the problem. It gives you a little bit more information on exactly what the problem is, how it starts, what the life cycle is and all of that. It's just a wealth of information. And kind of while we're on the subject, I did see a question about tomato hornworms. Shannon asks, have you ever seen tomato hornworms on your supertunias? So this is good. So let's do this again. And we're gonna search by pest this time. So let me go back to the home screen here. So we click search by pest. 
and we want to do insect control insects by name and let's find tomato hornworm so i'm just going to scroll down here maybe it's under just hornworm <laughs> yep right there under h click on it and then you see all of the different things that you can use in this case like thuricide the bt a bacillus thuringiensis is a natural solution um, and so that's the one that i would use if i found a tomato hornworm on my supertunia I though don't in my area, I've never actually seen a tomato hornworm. I know that they exist here, but thankfully they haven't found my garden yet. The squash bugs have, but the tomato hornworms haven't. Um, but BT is really good for budworms too, which is what I spray my supertunias with. So maybe they just stay away because I've already sprayed them. I don't know. Deborah says, is there anything that you've tried to grow that you just haven't had any luck with? Yes, uh, I tried to grow ginger this year and not a single thing came up. I planted like five roots and nothing. And I wondered, the roots felt a tiny bit spongy. I mean, they still were, still were firm, but there was a little bit of sponginess to them. And I'm not sure if maybe that was what my issue was, um, but that was a fail this year. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I don't have great luck with impatience. Um, I can get like the, the six pack impatience and I don't even know what variety they are, but they're like the inexpensive ones that stay really short. They don't really grow out. They just kind of flower throughout the year. I have great luck with those in my landscape, but um, other impatience, I just, I've had horrible luck with. Let me, let me think. Is there anything else, Aaron? What have I failed at? Uh, in the corner, you put Oh, you know right away. <laughs> <laughs> the milkweed? Yeah, so I did. I planted some milkweed seeds in a vlog early on this season, and that was complete user error because I planted them right before we went on kind of a longer trip, and I forgot to have anybody water them, and it was super dry, and so nothing came up. Um, so that was a fail, and that happens. Like, you know, when you get yourself spread a little bit thin, when you've got a big garden and you're trying to have everything look nice all the time, it's that's impossible, by the way. Um, but yeah, you just tend to forget some things and thankfully it was seeds and not something that costed me a lot of money. Oh, and that kind of goes along with Katie's question. Um, you have so many garden wins. Do you have any garden fails? So there you go. Those are my fails this year. I'm sure there are others. Amber asks, will you be doing a garden tour? Are you and Aaron doing landscaping for others on a full-time basis or will you be doing more at your house? I miss your house. Um, we will be doing a garden tour here soon. Uh, it's just been so darn hot and we've been just trying to keep on top of things. I'm sure we'll, we'll plan on doing one really soon, as soon as we have an overcast day. Like overcast is always the best days to do a garden tour because then you kind of avoid all the sh like harsh shadows. Um, so we typically like to wait for that. And in the middle of the summer, it's kind of few and far between. Um, as far as other people's homes, we just were going to be working on two or three other pe like friends and family homes this year, which we've already done one full one. Um, we're right in the middle of a, the second and we may or may not do a third, um, but we just thought it'd be fun to do some smaller projects like on smaller city lots um, because you know all of us have a different situation. And so you can always kind of take a little bit of something, I think from every situation. That's what I find about watching other people and what they do in their garden even if it's completely different than mine there's usually some kind of little tidbit um, of inspiration that I take from that um, so that's what we were hoping that those projects would do for you guys but we do have a lot more projects coming up at our house as well um, in fact we just cleared out a whole flower bed in the back uh, formal garden to start planting up so that will be coming up soon Amy asks, what is your favorite foods and what is Benjamin's favorite food my favorite foods I like all, all the foods I like Thai food a lot Thai food, any kind of Asian inspired food. I like uh, Mexican food though too. I like Italian. Benjamin likes Cheetos and mac and cheese. <laughs> mac and cheese. We do feed him he healthy stuff too. He likes bananas and blueberries, loves strawberries and raspberries. Um, what else does he really love? Spaghetti. Oh yeah, he's a huge spaghetti fan. He loves it. So Jennifer's question, which is kind of at the end here of her comment says, when you move a plant, can you ever disturb the root system so much that it won't bounce back when replanted? Yes, there's always a risk when you move a, a plant, especially when you're moving plants this time of year. Best time to do that is early on in the spring or kind of early in the fall to where it still has a chance to root in, like there's still maybe six weeks or so before the first hard frost so that plant has a chance to acclimate a little bit and root before winter hits. But early spring is typically the best time. I still move stuff no matter what time of year it is. Um, and you know, you win some and you lose some. Occasionally I'll have something that doesn't want to bounce back. But typically if I put a good starter fertilizer in the hole and I keep that thing wet all the time, 
um, it usually does fine. Um, but just know that there is a risk, especially the older the plant is, uh, the more risky it is. And you want to get as much of that root ball as possible to eliminate shock. Marie asks, how do you bait for earwigs? I use Bonide's Bug and Slug Killer. It's amazing, it lasts for several weeks, so I don't have to bait a ton, but it works really well. So Madeline asks about our gravel areas, like our driveway and especially our vegetable garden. Um, she says, your ground seems to be quite hard and firm, so I'm assuming you did not need to use a compactor before laying the gravel down. So uh, our driveway, the one that goes all the way around our house has been here for who knows how long. Um, the second year we were here, we had a new layer of gravel installed on the whole thing because it was quite thin in a lot of areas. And we used a three quarter chip in the color blue. Um, that's all the information I know about it. I really like the color because it, it appears a little bit more cool. It's like cool gray tones. Um, and I like really like that because it's so dusty and dry here and maybe that's why i stick with a cooler color palette out in my garden i don't want things to feel warmer than they actually are the gravel in front of the hay racks is a color that i don't love we haven't been able to find that blue again since we had the driveway done so that one's a little bit lighter color and there's a lot more like yellow and brown in it um, i mean it looks better than what that was prior, but I don't love the color of it. The vegetable garden area, I don't know if you guys remember, but there was a huge elm tree we had removed because it was starting to fall apart. And there was a big concrete weir we had removed out of the ground. So they brought in fill dirt and smoothed it out. Then we did lay landscape fabric over the top of it. We didn't compact it. And then um, we put the raised beds on top and cut the landscape fabric out from inside the raised beds. So the raised beds go straight down into soil, but the walkways remain with landscape fabric and then gravel on top. And it works really well for us. Um, and I don't use landscape fabric that often, but in situations like that where I do not want to use any kind of weed spray or any kind of spray that's not organic anywhere near my um, vegetable garden it's nice that the landscape fabric's there because we deal with bindweed really bad and puncture vines water grass i mean there's some horrible weeds out there that they will take over really quickly if we don't use that in some applications but our driveway has no landscape fabric it's all just compacted dirt and gravel uh, somebody asked can you do some more q a yes do you ever get snakes we had thick landscaping in our first house um, to where they had lots of garden snakes I don't see snakes that often. We do have them in our garden, like just little garden snakes. They're like this long. I don't mind them at all. Um, I don't like it when I accidentally almost step on one. It startles me occasionally, but I don't mind the fact that they're in here. And I actually never even think about it. When I'm rooting around in flower beds, I never think about like running into any kind of insect or snake or anything like that. It's just kind of part of it for me. Um, and I'm happy when I see stuff like that because if you find frogs and insects and snakes, it means you have a really healthy garden. Um, and I, I feel like if you're devoid of those things, you're using too many chemicals. <laughs> Next question is in regards to our West Side garden. I recently talked about it in actually a couple videos and posted a picture of what it's currently looking like. It's just a lot of evergreens and supertunia. A Vista snowdrift, so a, a bright white supertunia. It looks very crisp right now. And so I've been asking, because I've been wondering whether or not I should keep it like that and stick to a very limited color palette, maybe even just white and green and keep it a moon garden, or maybe white, green, and one other color, or should I go full on cottagey? And the response was overwhelmingly keep it green and white, which I was surprised and kind of excited about because I want an area like that really bad. I just couldn't figure out where exactly I would want it. So I think that's kind of the direction I'm gonna take it. And the question was from Tracy about how about making it a moon garden. Um, and so that may be the direction we go. Now we have a whole winter ahead of us where my mind has a lot of time to change. So I don't know exactly what's gonna happen, but right now I'm kind of leaning towards the white and the green, possibly a tiny bit of purple um, or like a soft apricot color, but not a whole lot of you know, color, just utilizing white blooms and white variegated foliage and different shades of green. And I think that would be so pretty because the whole rest of my garden is dedicated to kind of color. There's no, I mean, there's some formal areas like Versailles, the back formal garden, but there's a lot of flower beds that are just kind of willy nilly and kind of free and full of whatever I feel like planting at the time. So I think it's okay to have a space over there that maintains that like strict formality. So this next question is one I actually get almost every single day. Kathy asks, how do you garden with all that hair down all the time? I sweat just watching you. Um, and it is kind of, I know it looks weird. I'm out here in hundred degree heat with my hair down jeans and a long sleeve shirt, um, but I'm acclimated to it. It's how I've kind of dressed forever. And I don't fuss with clothes and hair and stuff like that very often. So I kind of just like do one thing and I stick with it for 
forever. This is how I wore my hair every single day at the garden center. I've just never been one to put my hair up much and you get used to it. Like occasionally I'll put my hair in a ponytail and then I'll burn the back of my neck and I'm like, why did I do that? <laughs> like I should just be wearing my hair down, um, but I'm just used to it. I mean, I still sweat a lot, but the beauty of making videos and being able to kind of like control a little bit what you guys are seeing, I can take a little break in between each take and wipe my face off. And I don't like fuss too much about it. I don't um, typically like go fix myself completely up, but I will like wipe dripping sweat off my face because I don't really want that. I mean, that would be distracting and it's kind of gross. So anyway, I do sweat. I do wear my hair down. I know it makes you guys kind of feel miserable on the other end um, seeing me do that, but I'm totally used to it. Uh, how many acres is your property? I'm so curious. It is two acres. What do you use to fertilize and how do you do it when they're already flushed and full? So when I initially plant my containers, I add in a slow release fertilizer and that feeds for about six to eight weeks um, and it is activated by heat. So it's nice to know that it's in there kind of slowly feeding the roots of my plants. And then I come through with a water soluble fertilizer once a week and fertilize all of my annuals with that. And I just water from overhead. I mean, you can kind of stick your hose in between the plants, um, but like all of our containers out along our fence line that Aaron and I are competing with right now, I mean, I just kind of water over the top and the foliage catches some of it, but most of it makes it down into the, you know, reservoir area and it just seems to work. The next question is in regards to the video that we actually uploaded this morning. Um, I was planting some purple haze butterfly bushes and I was talking about the difference between sterile and non-sterile varieties of butterfly bush. Um, so here's the deal, in the state of Oregon, it's illegal for us to plant a butterfly bush that is non-sterile because on the western side of the state, they pop up everywhere and it's termed a noxious weed. They have a really hard time controlling them. Um, as opposed to us over here on the eastern side of the state, we don't have the conditions to make them a noxious weed. If I planted a non-sterile variety, it would pretty much stay contained. Um, and we tried to have the quarantine kind of lifted in our county, but there was so much red tape that they were just like, it's not worth it. Um, but there are a couple of varieties that are sterile that we can plant. So the Miss series, Miss Violet and Miss Ruby, um, I'm probably missing one. And then the Lo and Behold series, which the one this morning in this morning's video is the Lo and Behold Purple Haze. So I'm always super excited when we find a butterfly bush that we can actually plant. Um, this is actually going back to the gazebo color question. Um, Lee asks if we've ever thought of staining the gazebo black or espresso. And I did entertain that thought very briefly when we painted the uh, vegetable garden fence black, but I think I need to stick with accents and fencing being black and not make any structures be completely black because I think it would make this look like too much of a chunk in the middle of the yard, if you know what I mean? Like there'd be too much dark color with the dark color of the shingles. So I'm thinking something a little bit lighter and softer. And the last one is not really a question, but I, I did see this a couple times, but um, I posted a picture of the front of our gazebo with our brick path kind of leading up to it. And then you could see the brick path back behind it and how it's like totally different from the front one. Um, and so Tracy said her, her OCD wants the same path on the opposite side. So does mine. <laughs> and I think in, eventually we'll get there. Uh, we decided, in fact, when we had the brick path put in on the west side, um, Aaron ordered a bunch more bricks because they went on sale for less than half of what we paid for them when we put in that brick pathway. So we have pallets and pallets, I think eight pallets of bricks sitting behind our barn so that we can pull from them and do little projects like we did in front of the gazebo and eventually behind the gazebo so that we have some continuing theme going on so that I don't have like a million different types of pathway around our house. We kind of like to keep things, um, I don't know, so that it looks like it's a continuous idea. Everything's cohesive. I don't know how to explain it. So that's it, you guys. I think that's all the questions I have today. It was just so much fun just to sit and relax and chat with you a little bit and answer some of your questions. And I'm hoping that when I answer questions, it's helpful for um, several of you because I notice a lot of repeat questions. Um, and so I try to grab those in particular so that I could answer them all at one time. Um, and you know, chances are if five people are asking, there's probably um, several more people who maybe have wondered um, and want to know, or maybe have asked the question in the past and hasn't been answered. So anyway, thanks so much again for watching and we will see you in the next video. Bye.